Now, this plan right here, I've actually created it probably about 10 years ago. And what it consists of is an actual blueprint for you to able to accomplish for you to accomplish $240,000 in net revenue per year doing real estate. So, let me give you a little bit of history about myself. Um, didn't start off with the best intentions in life. I'll be the first to admit. I dropped out of junior high school in ninth grade, so I got an eighth grade education. But that's never been a crutch for me when it comes to this business. I've been in this business for over 20 something years now, about 25 years now. Um, when I first started trying to learn this business, there was nothing out there. All I had to go off of was infomercials late at night. Now, during the daytime, I had a hell of a job. I was a curvy vacuum cleaner salesman. <laughs> I was that guy going in Catonsville, knocking on doors, trying to sell a $1,600 vacuum cleaner. Now, if you can sell a $1,600 vacuum cleaner, you can sell anything. Now, unfortunately, I didn't sell one. <laughs> but I realized something, that my lack of education meant that I had to do something else. I had to figure out a way to be successful in life. I had to figure out another plan, because my plan was not going back to school. My plan had to, recruit, had to involve getting the type of revenue that I wanted to live off of. So the infomercials started coming on late at night. And then Mr. Carlton Sheets come on. How to buy, no, how to buy houses with no money in I bought his course not one time, not two times, but I bought it three times. And the third time, I actually opened it up. So it sit on the shelf. Now, how many of you guys can experience the fact that you buy something from a guru or the speaker, and then after the workshop, the excitement goes down, and you just decide, what the heck did I just try to try to do this thing? Why did I try to do this? And that's exactly what happened with me. But that third time, I really applied myself. Because at that third time, one of the things that course mentioned was get with people who are in the know. Successful as footprints. Follow those footprints. So I got myself a coach. Now, I didn't have much money. So what I did was trade my time with the ability to learn real estate investing. I quit selling Kirby vacuum cleaners. Now, at the time, I was living at home in the basement of my mom's house. And I had a visual plan on my wall that involved a Mitsubishi 3000 GT. <laughs> and I said, when I make it, that car will be in my driveway. But I had to get there first. So I got with a coach, and he was, at that time, he was one of the most experienced investors doing it left and right, deals after deals after deals after deals, each and every month. So I said, let me work for you for free. And I worked with him for eight months. My salary was $50 a week in lunch for eight whole months. That was my salary. And I was happy. Because now that I look back, after that eight months was over, I had enough character, I had enough knowledge to go out and be dangerous, and I did my first real estate deal. And I've been a full-time investor ever since. My first real estate deal was $2,500. I remember it was like it is yesterday. And I had to split it with my partner. And it still proved to me that real estate works. Because for a lot of you here, real estate won't work until you get that first paycheck. And when you get that first paycheck, you realize this works. So after that point in time, I've been blessed with the opportunity to create a lot of businesses, two of which was Win Win Property Solutions and a company called Aspire America. And at that time, I was mentoring over 
250 students here in Berlin. Um, who was doing TV commercials, radio commercials, you name it, he was doing it. Kenneth Gills was one of my students. Um, I've worked and had the opportunity to mentor, coach, and work with the people like Marcel Humphrey, Mark Whitney. Um, the, the Secretary of Housing, Ray Skinner, was one of my students. And I took that path to real estate as a way to grow. My biggest deal I've ever done, commercial real estate deal in downtown Baltimore, was $3.5 million. It was a total of 31 buildings, had a total of 250 units. And this was a kid that had never even bought a commercial deal. Now we purchased that deal, it took us one year to close. The problem with that one deal, this is the good, the bad, and the ugly about the real deal. And that's what we try to get to you guys, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The only difference between you doing a deal where you make $10,000 and a deal where you make $3 million is the zeros. But remember this. All that glitter is not gold. We had a couple warnings when I purchased that deal. My job and my partnership was the guy that would negotiate and find the deals. My partner was the guy to go out and get the financing. So I found this deal down in Mount Vernon. 30 apartment buildings, 250 units. The guy was known as the number one slumlord in Merlin. But that's okay because we're bad. We can overcome that. There's such a thing called false appreciation where you can take any negative in a property and build it up to bring in a positive. So we just knew we was gonna apply false appreciation to these apartment buildings. There was a little hiccup. Mistake number one, we should have known. And this is a lesson I've learned. If a seller wants to back out of a deal, let them back out. The seller of those apartment buildings wanted to back out because one of the people that was involved in the transactions, he didn't like and he didn't like his reputation. So he said, no, we're not gonna sell you these deals. So we sued him. The bad part is we won. But it cost us over $100,000 in legal fees to force this guy to sell us these properties so that we could be the biggest minority owners of real estate in downtown Baltimore. Now, move forward five years. Well, actually it was three and a half years. We're still evicting every tenant out of the properties. Because part of the plan with that project was to evict, to evict all the 250 tenants, rehab the buildings, and to bring back in new tenants systematically. The problem was rehab took one year, two years, three years. And during the third year, I had a heart attack. I actually had a heart attack working that business. When I got out of hospital, it was it for me. My comfort level was residential, but I just knew do commercial, it's no problem at all. So the first thing I did when I got out, of, got out of the hospital was to sell my interest in those buildings. And I was happy. And I've been happy ever since. I never got back into commercial. I've been doing residential deals now. Like I said, for over 20 years. I've done several hundred deals. You name it, I've done it. And like I said, I've had the opportunity to work with, educate, and coach some of the most successful people in Berlin and around the country. Today, I do about two different presentations, probably two speaking engagements a month. I speak all around the country. I got two books published. Um, so I'm very happy with my placement in life right now. And what I'm going to give you right now is a plan that you can implement. I want you to realize that you can substitute that 240 a year to 100 a year, to 80 a year to whatever suits your needs when it comes to what you need to achieve in real estate investment. This is what I call my goal triage. It starts off with creating a square that has four levels of your goals. Those four levels is your daily activities, your weekly activities, 
your monthly activities, and your yearly goals. This plan is built around $240,000 a year as a successful real estate investor. It starts off with identifying what strategies, or should I say, what exit strategy type of investor you want to be. Young lady asked the question of how do you decide which strategy to do? Well, the easy answer is, can he touch the it himself? Was well, it's based on your financial needs. If you currently have bills that is just piling up and you need to get money influx in every month, then wholesaling is going to be that strategy. If you're looking to build a long-term wealth for your kids and generational income moving forward, then that strategy is going to be landlord, buying and holding. If that is not a need for influx of cash right now, but if you want to get big lump sums of income in a regular periodic manner, then that strategy is going to be rehab. So decide what strategy based on your lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle changes that you're doing to choose which strategy you should do. That's the easiest way to answer that question. What is your immediate need in your life? Next, you want to take that thought and now you got to decide exactly which marketing plan you're going to implement. I always tell everyone we work with that you want to have at least four to seven different marketing strategies each and every month. I'm going to say that again. Four to seven different marketing strategies. This plan is built around the strategies of probate investing, bandit and lease, Craigslist, driving for dollars, absentee owners, bankruptcies, code enforcement, and internet marketing. Those are the marketing strategies that build out this $240,000 a year income. Now there's one little strategy up here that I've coined called bandit leasing. <coughs> Not that many people is doing that strategy. You all know what bandit signs is and the issue that you have with bandit signs. What we're doing with banded leasing is we're making arrangements with property owners and we're putting big banners on their buildings. And we're paying them either residual income off of a deal or we're paying them a monthly income to keep it on there. Why? I don't have to worry about any sign police. I'm dealing with owners of their properties. There's so many different vacant owners in this neighborhood, in, this, in, this, in Baltimore. Why worry about banded signs? That's a strategy which we've been doing for about three years now. So these are the marketing strategies that we're doing. If I go a little bit further into the probate strategy, there's a website called Pacer. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Correct that. For the probate strategy, I'm going down to the courthouse right at 300 North Calvert Street. And we're actually going in there and pulling the actual probate listings of individuals that have gone into probate that actually have real estate in their estates. And we're doing a marketing campaign based on that. The actual Craigslist strategy. That strategy is going after nothing more than for sale by owners. We're marketing directly to for sale by owners on Craigslist. And I'm going to go into further details as far as how we're doing it. Driving for dollars. My driving for dollars strategy is nothing more than driving around neighborhoods, but we've also added another touch to the driving for dollars strategies. The neighborhoods that we're driving around, we're, we're putting flyers into people's doors. So we're looking for so many deals in various neighborhoods, but we're actually putting flyers in those neighborhood doors based on how much we love the areas. So my um, with the flyers, uh, while we're seeing evidence, also we uh, oh it is. What, uh, what have you been doing to you know, work around that or get around it? My, see, my my strategy for getting around it is a strategy is, is something called call tracking by call fire in a, my favorite phone, my throwaway track phone. So I'm using call tracking from Callfire 
and my throwaway track phone. Now, let me give you the details of this. Call Fire gives you a local number that you can use and tag up to whatever marketing strategies you use. So in other words, whatever strategy we do, we have a different telephone number for. Each strategy has their own telephone number. Call, call Fire get, cost me $3 to get a number and $1 a month to rent it. So for $4 up front and $1 a month, I can have a telephone number that actually forwards to my main tracking phone. I'm able to tell each and every month how many deals came in from COVID, how many deals came in from Bandit, Craigslist, driving, absentee, bankruptcy, code enforcement, and internet, because I'm using tracking numbers going to my track phone. The other advantage of using call fire tracking is that every time I pick up the phone and answer it, it tells me, Craigslist, COVID, bankruptcy. And actually have a feature called Whisper, and it tells you where the call came from, which marketing strategy you used. Now, the most important part of the strategy, because I use a lot of VAs in my business, is that I'm able to record the telephone conversation of both sides of the conversation that my VAs is having with the sellers that's coming through that system. Now, why do I want to do that? Because now I can see if my system is being operated properly. Are my VAs answering the, phone, or answering the phones properly? Are they saying the right words? Is everything working that the flow of my business should work? And if it's not, I can make corrections. All of that is built into the call fire call tracking system. One more point. You can now have your business virtually anywhere around the country when you use that because you can get a phone number, a local number, anywhere around the country, and it will forward to your phone. Any questions regarding this? Going back, like I said, we're driving for dollars. We're driving around the hot areas. Once I get to these hot areas, we're also putting in flyers in those neighborhood doors. The absentee owner strategy, very simple, very simple. All we're doing is making a list. There's one service that I want to recommend to you guys to use. And this is how you're able to pull your own list. It's called ListSource.com. ListSource.com allows you to create what's called a targeted list where you can decide exactly where you want to market at and so on. What I do with this, we create a demographic area. You can either do the whole state of Maryland, you can do zip codes, or you can do carrier routes. Well, the question you may ask, well, what is a carrier route? A carrier route is the postal route that your, 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 your um, uh, mail carriers will go when they're going down a block. I'll give you an example. Say you know Baltimore City has areas where it's one block to the next block could be just hurled. So you, want to only, you only want to market into those blocks that you know where there are great looking houses. You, that's where the carrier route strategy comes into play. So once you identify the neighborhoods you want to invest in, then you would go ahead and pull your absentee owners list from Act from um, Corp this source and take advantage of marketing to absentee owners with a yellow letter campaign. I've been doing yellow letters for over 15 years now. It's the most successful marketing direct mail campaign you can do. Let me say that again. The yellow letter will be the most successful direct mail marketing campaign you can do by far. The average return rate or the average what you would call click-through rate on a normal email campaign is between 0.5 and 2.5%. That's the average conversion rate that you can hope to get when you do normal direct mail marketing. And that's considered good. 0.5 to 2.5% is considered good. So for, one, uh, for every 100 letters you get, you put out, you're getting 2.5 leads out of it. That's considered good in the industry. With yellow letters, my average rate is between 15 and 19 percent. Now there is one variable. A large part of my direct mail campaign is going to targeted individuals, targeted lists. I also do shotgun, which is basically just putting up banded signs and seeing what stick. But a lot of my marketing revolves around targeted lists. How many of you guys realize that an absentee owner list has two purposes? And what I mean by that? You realize what I'm talking about? Buyers and sellers. There you go. 
Very few people realize that an absentee owner's list not only gives you sellers, but buyers for your deals. When you pull a list from a company like ListSource, not only am I building up a seller's list, I'm building up a buyer's list because when that list comes back, there's duplicate addresses. What I mean by duplicate addresses? I mean owners that own more than one property because they're absentee owners. So what am I doing now? I'm going to market to those owners that own more than one property and let them know that I'm looking to sell them properties, deals. I'm going to give you the numbers on how you do this. This is huge. You're able to take that list of absentee owners, do a function in Excel called pivot table. That function will tell you where the absentee owners are doing the most buying at. So I can pivot that table and find out that 21206 has 46 absentee owners buying in there. 21214 has 32. 21206 only have five. So now I'm dealing with the hot areas where investors are actually buying. Here's one key point. My absentee owners list when I'm using this strategy is only three months old. So I'm only searching for absentee owners in the last three months. Why? Because the average turnaround time for a rehab is about three months. Two to three months is the average turnaround time, which means that absentee owner is now ready for a new project. That's huge. I told you, I got some stuff for you. Any questions regarding this? Let's go with you first. I'm saying, what'd you say? I haven't used listability. It doesn't, I wouldn't say that the issue is the list company. The issue really is doing the strategy. So you could use a listability. You could use any other company that will allow you to make that search. Sorry. For the uh, absentee list for buyers, so you're going back three months, you only look at people in multiples, and that's it, or are you looking for anybody who bought the last three months? Yeah. And I, 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 usually, I usually tailor that based on the areas that I like. So if I like five or six zip codes, I would do that. Or if I like a particular county, I would do that whole county and then make my, my, um, my, my qualifications based on those results. That's the thing. Did I explain it right? I'm saying are you looking for people like people doing multiple properties in that zip code? Yes. Anybody who's bought in no. Well, both. Remember, if you don't respond, I'm mailing them once every 45 days for a year. I get calls from people who said, I got your letter a year ago, it was in my drawer, I'm ready to sell my house. But this is only being done to my targeted hot list. What is a targeted hot list? I'll give you an example. Absentee owners that have equity in their properties, that's late on their mortgage. That's a targeted hot list. I will mail that person until the cows come home. Mm -hmm. You can buy this for you can buy from this brokers. Question is, how do you know they're late? I use a service, it's high end. It's called SRDS, Standard Rate and Data Service. It's the local brokerage for all of the list brokerage companies all around the nation. I can find any kind of list broker that I want using SRDS. A six month, a six month membership with that is about $395. But it gives me the flexibility to find some really good targeted lists. Let's go further. Bankruptcy. I'm using Pacer. I love bankruptcy leads. Pacer is the service which you can use. It's the government entry point for all the different bankruptcy courts around the nation. It's free to sign up. 
but for every document you pull, it's 10 cents. They bill you on a quarterly basis. You would do a search in PACER for people that have opened and closed bankruptcies and it, for a two week period, you're looking for the field, and I was, I was going to show you guys, but that's why the internet, so I'm trying to tell you what I'm actually doing. I'm actually leaving open the trustee field inside of PACER, and I'm actually going to pull that list as a Excel spreadsheet. Once I get that list pulled, I'm doing my exact marketing direct mail campaign with that list. I understand that it's a business, you're doing business, you have to have business expenses, mm -hmm. but it sounds like you're paying for an awful lot of stuff. That's a two hundred and forty thousand dollars a year income. Your business expenses will be based on how much you're trying to make a year. So for that number for that, that's what I've discovered that I'm going to be using. That's what I learned that will generate me two hundred and forty thousand dollars a year. Like I said, you tailor this plan based on the amount of money you want to make. We just talked about marketing strategies. This whole plan breaks down what you do every day, every month, every week, and every year. If you only want to do, would make twenty thousand dollars a year, you could tailor this plan for that. Because you would only do a couple of the marketing strategies, and you would do it in differently, different manner. So this plan will work for anyone. Any questions about bankruptcy? So you're. How are you doing in terms of when you get on the thing? Are you looking at a zip code? I'll tell you. What I'm doing on PACER, PACER allows you to choose any, ge any, any geographic location, Maryland, um, the state of Maryland, or cities in Maryland. So I can pull up the actual cities or states where I want to find people that fits my criteria. My, career, my criteria is open cases and closed cases for a two-week period. So that's what I'm looking for. Um, now, what is this two-week period? That's the that's the date range. Oh, okay. Open cases and cold cases. I'm sorry, open cases and cold closed cases for two weeks. The reason why I'm doing two weeks because there's hundreds of them. So if you're in a smaller geographic location, you could do three or four weeks. But in Maryland, there's hundreds of these cases. And my strategy is based on these numbers that I'm going to show you that we're doing. In Pacer, can you easily distinguish between a Chapter 7 and 13? You're actually putting that designation. The question is, can you distinguish between Chapter 7 and Chapter 13, which is two different types of bankruptcy? The answer is yes, because you're actually putting that in the system. You only want cases that are Chapter 7 and 13. That's what you're going after. What were you saying about the trustees and the adults? Yes. I, really, I can explain that to you if I was, had it up on the screen, but one of the fields asks you to select a trustee or just select all. You would choose select all. Now, code enforcement. I love them. Code enforcement. I love them. Code enforcement. I love them. And the reason why, these people are in trouble for the most part. They got issues with their properties that the actual courts it's saying that you need to fix this or you're going to be fine. My way of dealing with code enforcement, you know where rent court is? Yeah. There's an actual courtroom for code enforcement. We actually go and sit down and hear all the cases that's being called, what the fi possible fines are, and we take that information down and either approach that owner at the courthouse or we do direct mail marketing to that owner. A lot of people don't know about that strategy. How many of you guys need to do that? You can do that. That's another huge strategy. We're looking for low hanging fruit. These marketing campaigns are built around low hanging fruit. Fruit where you know that if you pick it, it will be so juicy. <laughs> but you know you will make some money. And mama will be happy. Last but not least, my favorite. Hearing that means. I love optimization. I love optimization. And what I mean by that, 
We're optimizing videos. We're optimizing press releases. We're optimizing articles. We're optimizing our websites, our squeeze pages, and so on. And what we're doing is making these items to show up on the first page of Google so that we're getting traffic each and every day, each and every month to our web properties so that we can get leads. Your business online isn't just a website. Don't just think that you should optimize your website and then that's it. You need to optimize all the different web channels and now you can dominate the first page of Google. I have, well, I have clients right now that we're working with real estate brokerage in Toledo, Ohio, Flex Realty. We, he is seven out of 10 spots on the actual Google search for his business. Uh, national, a, a local real estate investor, that is a RIA in Kansas City. If you do a search for learn real estate investing in Kansas, that person has 10 of the 10 spots on Google for that term. Mm -hmm. Now what does that translate to? Do you know an example? One of my clients is Nolan Henson of Henson Property Management. We optimize his website for the term um, Property Management Baltimore. Property Management Baltimore gets over 2,400 searches a month. That's 2,400 searches a month. For a property management company, that's a potential income of $240,000 a month. Just by being on the first page of Google. Any questions about this? Because your internet is huge. Now, we talked about the marketing strategies. Now you gotta have the exit strategies to execute the marketing that leads that comes in. These are my five primary strategies. We wholesale. We lease options with linking. We do tenant placement. We do rent having, and we do guaranteed rent. Wholesaling. I don't need to explain to you guys what that means, correct? Everybody knows how wholesaling is. Getting a property in the contract, controlling that property, and now selling your interest in that property. The law states that having a property in the contract gives you an equity position in that property. By having an equity position in a property, you can now sell that equity position, which is your wholesale fee. That's wholesale. Lease option or linking. I love it. All I'm doing is putting the person who has a house that they can't sell with a person that wants to do a lease with that property to own, and I'm collecting the deposit. I'm not doing anything other than collecting the deposit by being a transactional engineer. Tenant placement, same concept. I don't want to manage properties, not after a heart attack. What I want to do, but I do manage properties, my own. With tenant placement, I'm doing the exact same thing. I'm locating distressed property owners, not distressed properties, distressed property owners who can't rent their properties. And because of my marketing expertise, I'm finding them a tenant. And that distressed property owner is paying me on average $1,000 per tenant. Think about it. How many of those do you need if you're working full time to make a good part time income a month? Two or three? That's 3,000 clams. That's what tenant placement is. Rehabbing, you know what that is. Rehabbing is the most difficult and intricate strategy you could choose. There are so many different moving pieces. You have to buy the property at the right price. You have to control the contractors. You have to manage the actual process of the closing. You have to find a good seller, a good real estate agent. You have to, you have to, you have to. More people have been hurt rehabbing 
than almost any other strategy out there. It requires the most knowledge. So when you decide to choose which strategy to work, you better realize that it will require a lot of learning to get up to speed or partnering with someone that can provide you that education as part or in trade for your partnership, like working with a contractor and so on. And last but not least, guaranteed rent. I don't know if a lot of you guys realize this, but my company really started this industry, tenant placement, about 10 years ago. We are the only ones out there marketing online for keywords for tenant placement. So we literally cornered this market, and now it's everywhere. Everyone is doing tenant placement. Now, guaranteed rent program. A lot of people don't know about this one. This one is a form of sandwich leasing, but all you're doing is finding a distressed seller or homeowner. And you're telling them, I will lease your property with the right to sublease, and I will guarantee you your rent each and every month, regardless if the property is vacant or occupied. Not only that, but I will do all the minor repairs. You would only have to cover any major repairs. Heat, electrical, roof. I'll also tell them, I will even do the make ready if my client moves out of your property. Think about this. I'm going to give that seller or that rent the owner his money guaranteed each and every month for the lifetime of that property. Guaranteed, no vacancies whatsoever. Here's the caveat. If the owner is trying to get, let's say, $900 a month, I'm going to offer him seven for guaranteed <coughs> rent. Now that owner's going to say, oh, well, if I factor in vacancy, if I factor repairs, if I factor in that, I'm really only making 700 anyway. So I'm not losing anything. Not to mention, my property's been vacant for three months. That's $2,100 already I lost. Hell yeah, I'll do that. Now, I'm taking over that $700 a month property. I'm going to get nine, twelve, eighteen hundred dollars a month. I'm, I'm waiting for the questions. Charles, how are you going to get eighteen hundred dollars a month? For a regular three two. I'm going to get eighteen hundred dollars a month. Because I'm going to rent out rooms. I'm going to rent a room at 120 to 150 a week. I have a strategy where I determine a neighborhood, whether it's good for renting out rooms or whether it's good for market rate tenants. We're talking about forced appreciation. Find a weakness in a marketing, find a weakness in a real estate asset and maximize that weakness to a profit. And that's what I'm doing with guaranteed rent. How do you determine what child is good for room when it's for a What I call my low to medium low areas, I'm doing rooms. What I call my medium high to high and high rental areas, I'm doing rentals. So if you're 
Baltimore City states that any four residents can live in an actual residence without it being a four without it being a boarding house, without it being licensed as a boarding house as long as it's four unrelated residents or less. The minute you go above four unrelated residents, it's now considered a boarding house and it requires licensing. Your biggest issue is going to be whether or not that neighborhood likes the fact that it's a boarding house. That's why I'm doing it in low to medium low income areas. Not to mention, think about it, in a three bedroom house. How many people know me living in? At least three. Maybe if there's two kids, share your room or something. Or should I say maybe even four, you're talking about a husband and wife and two kids. So in a rooming house where you got four people, how many people living in it? I still got four people, correct? I have not made that house into a roach motel. I still have the same amount of people that will be in a normal rental. Except I'm doubling my cash flow. I love real estate. Okay. Well, I'm doing it in the low to medium low well, income areas. Zone. Well, for me, what a war zone is an area that has less than. Well, let me put like this. I won't rent in an area that has more than two board ups. If a block has more than two board ups, I won't touch it because I want rental properties that's available to be that, that people want to rent in. I don't, a war zone, I won't touch what you would call a war zone. 75% board ups, 85% board ups. I won't even touch those. Two board ups or less. And then one of those two is going to be leaving when I put a person in that property. Now, here's the other key to all of my rental strategies. I'm only looking for properties that are in the best condition. I'm not trying to come out of pocket with any repairs. The most I will come out of pocket with repairs is $2,000. That's it. Now, let's go down and drill down to your actual daily, weekly, monthly, yearly execution. Let's see, should we start? Let's start with daily. To execute this strategy, Remember, you could make it based on what you want to achieve. Two, four year, a year may not be the income you want to achieve. Here's what we're working. We're doing letters. My letters each week, each, each week, we're doing six hours needed to create my letters. Six hours for all of my direct marketing campaigns requires six hours a week time. For my banded signs, it requires four hours a week. For my Craigslist postings and replies, we're executing that at three hours a week. For my courthouse to achieve my probate, my code enforcement, and my bankruptcy, that requires six hours worth of time a week. For my driving for dollars, I'm spending three hours worth of time a week on that. For my negotiations and closings, I allocate seven hours a time, seven hours a week for that. Now, this is the most important part for me. This is why this one has the most hours allocated. I will do everything when it comes to negotiating and closing. That's all I do in my business. Negotiate and close. My VAs do all the rest. All I do is negotiate and close. Here's something you need to learn. You as an investor, you need to concentrate on the one thing or things 
that will mo make the most money in your business. And for me, it's executing a marketing plan and negotiating. Those are the two most profitable sides of my business. And that's what I'm concentrating on. Admin and miscellaneous hours, three hours a week. And last but not least, online website and squeeze page marketing, six hours a week. This is a 40 hour a week plan. If you don't have 40 hours, and you're only doing this for 20 hours, expect the results of half to $240,000 a year. You're talking about $120,000 income. So it does not have to mean that you need to work a full-time job of 40 hours and do your real estate for 40 hours. Base it on what you have available, and it's built around that structure. Now, Every day, I'm allocating this amount of time to execute this marketing. Every week, this better be my results of what I've done. When you're driving around and you're trying to find properties, you're looking and you're knocking on the door and you can't find that owner because, because every, every indication says that the person still lives there, but you know the house is vacant because the windows are broken. The grass is like you would not believe. It looks like the Singarity Plains in Africa. So you're trying to figure out what's going on with this property. I do two main things. One of them I use a, a, search, a free search called Pitbull, P-I-P-L. The other one is a paid search called Private Eye, PrivateEye.com. And last but not least, if that doesn't work, I'm hiring a skip tracer. A what? A skip tracer. A skip tracer is nothing more than a detective that will go out and try to find that person for you. Normal cost for skip tracers, I'm paying between $35 and $65 per trace. So if you spend sixty-five dollars to find a person that has a vacant house that you can make twenty-five thousand dollars, is it worth it? Yeah. Skip tracers is my last resort. www.google tell me where to find skip tracers. I'm just saying, just do a search online for skip tracers. You can do a search on Google for skip tracers, and you'll find a hundred of them, at least. I'm going 50 to 100 flyers a week. As to the owners, I'm going 250 letters a week. As to the buyers, I'm mailing out to 50 of those a week. Bankruptcy, I'm going 100 letters a week. So, your results, this is what you should be doing every day. And by the end of the week, this should be your measurement. That's your results. If you're not optimizing or maximizing your plan, you're not working your goals, you will not get your results. The first thing is to make a plan and stick with it. Create that plan and execute it each and every week with these results. If you didn't execute that plan and got these results each and every week, you're slacking. Now, remember I told you, you can tailor this to what you need to do with this. Question for you. Uh, I understand what an absentee owner is. Absentee buyer, I'm assuming you're talking about a property that's been for sale for the same period of time but, and still on market. The question is, what's an, you know what an absentee owner is an absentee buyer. Remember, I told you an absentee owner is type two. Parameters, two, two results. It gives you absentee owners, 
and they give you the owners of those absentee properties are buyers. So that's what I'm saying. Right. They're the actual owners of the absentee properties. Those are actually buyers. Any questions regarding your weekly goals? Uh, you say two. I can't just see what it is. I say two hundred emails. The, the Craigslist. Or? Remember, my Craigslist marketing is based around for sale by owner. We have a marketing plan that we go out and I actually have a call center to actually call all the for sale by owner leads and see if they're interested in selling their properties. We're doing two hundred calls, at least two hundred calls in our lead sheet system each week from Craigslist. So we're identifying leads in Craigslist. We're identifying properties in Craigslist that we want to go out. Remember, one thing I want the most important thing I want you guys to know, almost every real estate deal has an opportunity to pull deal. You may not know or realize the exit strategy to pull the money out, but almost every real estate deal that's for sale, there's opportunity for profit. Did I answer that question? Any other questions regarding Weebly? It's not really regarding weekly, and I don't want to hammer this too much, but that 240 is profit, right? That's Again. Profit. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm taking this, which is my weekly goals and my <coughs> weekly results, and multiplying it times four for my monthly barometer. Right. Craigslist is 800, Bandit Science is 300 to 400 a month, Bandit Lease, I'm doing three to five a month, Probate, 200 a month, Appetite Zone, 1,000 a month, um, Appetite Buyer, 200 a month, um, dollars, buying, driving for dollars and flyers. I got eight hours, so I actually should be, uh, should be 400 to 200. What you're doing is creating a marketing machine. There's no doubt whatsoever you need to have multiple marketing strategies. What happens when you're fishing a pond without any fish? You go home. What happens when you put your eggs, all your eggs in one basket? That's why I will never only do one way of marketing. Because life happens, strategies run out, and you will be left dry wondering where is your money. Not all strategies require hard money lenders. Um, normally, uh, as a broad answer, rehabbers use private money, rehabbers use hard money. Very few rehabbers are using um, institutional lenders, but they're out there, um, but very few are using institution, in, 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 institutional money. But yes, it's normally rehabbing, but that's just a broad stroke. Any other questions? Through all this, like how much is the marketing on that cost on a monthly basis? Good question. The question is, how much on a monthly basis is this plan? Thirty eight hundred dollars a month. Does that include VAs? Hmm? Does that include VAs? Or that is just marketing. That's the marketing. My VAs. and 600 a month. Now, let me go down to the whole VA part you just mentioned. Actually, let me go to my team. I have two realtors, two title companies, three contractors, uh, two private vendors, and also two VAs, one full-time, one part-time, and I'm missing one more person. Oh, actually, I'm missing four people my um, wholesalers that I work with, four wholesalers. 
Copy that. Uh, that would be Marcel, uh, Uche, <coughs> Chris, and Mark. Now, the reason why I also use wholesalers in my business, maximize your outcome. I believe in, this, in the, the concept OPT. You know what that is? Other people's time. And something else Ken have said earlier. I'd rather have a little bit of something instead of a whole lot of nothing. So I will partner with wholesalers when the opportunity arrives to market my gifts. I'll back at the point with the, um, written out the brooms. The question is, Charles, do you have a problem finding somebody to manage those properties? No. And here's the reason why I don't have a problem. Um, I consider myself an expert manager. Starting out, you will have issues. That's the reason why I don't have a problem. I know, and not only that, one of my best mentors that I've, I've met, had the opportunity to work with, was Bill Fell. And he said once, and this is one of the things he's always said, once you get up and running in your business, you, all you need to do is manage your managers. Once you get to the level where you're at, where properties are five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you need to seriously think about hiring managers to manage your properties, and all you concentrate on the education required to manage your managers. Um, what's your single residence, but mm -hmm. like multiple yeah. It's going to be full-time effort or three-time effort, absolutely. But part of the managing process is knowing how to interview and review and get people that are good people in your properties. But a couple of the management companies that I've talked to said that they did not want to do the management. Then here's what I've learned in real estate. You're going to always be firing. If deals drive up in Catonsville, what am I going to do? I'm going to stay in Catonsville? What are you going to do? You're going to go somewhere else. That's, that's the easiest answer. I'm going to continue to look until I find somebody that will do that. VA is virtual assistance. Virtual assistance. And this is a monthly. $600 a month, $400 a month. My full-time person is getting 600. My part-time person is getting 400. The initial calls go to them. Part of my systems involve. Um, well, I have I have two parts of my system that involves an answer machine, where they choose a selection and they get pre recorded message. But besides that, they're going through the most the questionnaire aspect of the business, and I have a rating system that goes from hot, cold, warm in regards to the leads that come across my table. Here's a lead that's hot, here's a little bit of warm, here's a cold one. And that's how we're rating the app. That's how I'm rating the ones I'm talking to immediately and so on. If you're coming out of the blocks brand new, what's a reasonable and realistic time frame to integrate all those marketing strategies? You don't need to integrate all of them. Remember what I said. You want to have at least four marketing strategies. You need to choose four and stick with them. The integration is based on how you implement them on your daily level, how much time you have available. So you can't put, you can't squeeze time out of a clock that has stopped working. So if you only have 40 hours a day, I'm sorry, 24 hours a day, then you only can implement X amount of duties, X amount of tasks in 24 hours. If you're working full time, you only have X amount of time. I would, I would hastily say that. You need to be able to at least allocate 15 to 20 hours a week in this business. At the very least, if you're not allocating that, you're taking this, this business as if it's a hobby. 
The only exception to that is you are a hell of a person when it comes to systemizations. Because then you can get away with less than this. Where do you find your virtual assistants? Where do I find my virtual assistants? Okay. I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that. <laughs> okay. I'm going to give you guys a website. And here's the, here's the task. Here's what I'm going to ask in order to give you the website. No, actually, I'll give you more. I'll give you guys this exact marketing plan. Not only that, I'll also give you guys um, copies of one of my books. <laughs> All I'm going to ask you to do, how many of you guys have Facebook? All I want you to do, take a picture of this, post it on Facebook, and just talk about your experience at the real deal meeting. That's it. That's all you have to do. When you talk about your experience at the real deal meeting, put Kenneth Gill's name in it or my name in it, and that's how we'll know that you actually did that task. And I'll actually send you my bonus to you. So just take a picture, post it to your Facebook with a caption of your experience at the real deal meeting. Now, I got one last part to go into. The yearly goal accomplishments. By the end of that year, if you're executing these multiple marketing strategies, these multiple exit strategies, you're doing at least two rehab flips, at least 20 tenant placements. I'm sorry, let me back it up. You're doing at least 60K in rehabs, two of them. You're doing at least 20 tenant placements which will equal 20,000. The average tenant placement revenue is $1,000 per deal. You're doing at least six lease placements and five guaranteed rents a year with an average yearly income of 60K. And last but not least, you're doing the rest in your wholesale deals. I think that number was, ooh, was it about 24? I think, uh, I think around 24. Wholesale deals in one year. <laughs> That's your two hundred and forty thousand dollars a year business. Any questions regarding that? <coughs> Any questions at all? So you want to talk about like um, in that nice thing, like building a house in the wholesale rehab? I got that factor in into negotiations and closing. What the hell are you doing? Stop sending me these damn letters. You, I'm going to turn you into the Attorney General. I had that happen to me before. I took them off my list. Well, the question is, would you put a return address? The return address is the post office box. Here's something else. Here's another strategy that I, this is, this is a gold mine strategy. I've used this strategy. You want to have a physical address instead of a P.O. box. You want a physical address instead of a P.O. box. USPS store, UBS store will let you call a post office box, 211 East Lombard Street, Suite 200. That's my address. It's a post office box. Now you are a professional business. One more question. Post office now does that as of about a year ago, and it's a lot cheaper than UPS. There you go. All right. Post office does that as well. So you just make up an address? No. Whatever the address of your box is, 
That's your company's address. My post office, my, 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 U, my UPS company is at 200 East Lombard Street. My box number is 211. So my address is 200 East Lombard Street, Suite 211. Order you were saying first you start off with the yellow market letter. I mean the yellow yeah, the sequential order again is you immediately send out your letter. Then I'm going to send out a second letter in two weeks. Then I'm going to send the next one out three weeks after that. And then I'm going once a month for one year. I thought but, you said you do the postcard. At, at well, I, I, well, I'm talking about when I say letter, I didn't go into which one. Uh, but I, yeah, I meant the postcard, but I just okay. just called it letter. Now, here's something else. So wait a minute, which stage does the postcard come? After the first. Here's the key. After the first letter, you can send a postcard after any one of those letters. My first letter is always a yellow letter. My postcard would either go second or third, but I'm going to always do a yellow letter on the once a month side. Is that a normal size postcard or you go to your size? Normal size. In fact, my, my postcard is either bright fluorescent yellow or bright fluorescent pink. Any other questions? When you try, when you look for the uh, mail.